Chapter Ten of Betty Baird's Golden Year by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Ten, Minturn Manor. On they pursued their journey. Miss Minturn having telephoned to Mrs. Baird and received permission to take Betty to her grand aunt's. What a life I am leading you! she exclaimed as she dropped into a seat in the car at the grand central station a dance miss minturn replied betty with a saucy smile adding and you know how i love to dance this time the railway station which betty could see from a distance as they rounded a long curve was a squat attractive building of gray stucco with a pleasant red roof welcoming the coming guest a carriage took them by a circuitous route and at the top of a steep hill looking out over a beautiful ravine the driver halted do you see that hill over there he asked pointing his whip with pride to the dim horizon if it wa'n't for that hill we could see the sound from this very spot yes said miss minturn settling back and closing her eyes with determination betty giggled a little to herself but leaned forward for she had not lost those pleasant anticipations of the beauties of nature gratuitously pointed out and while her faith was unequal to removing the mountain between her and the sound yet the green hazy valley below shot through with dazzling yellow roads and a gray winding stream repaid her jogging along a broad road overarched by oaks locusts and elms and past the old stone mill they alighted at a commanding house built in the dutch style which stood in the centre of wide-spreading acres sparsely covered with grass and stubble magnificent trees showing neglect however dotted the lawn while the spring air and the warm early sunshine brought out wistful odors of things planted long ago which survived by the courtesy of nature alone box lilacs bayberry and callicanthus in response to the thunder of the immense brass eagle knocker the heavy mahogany door was swung back by a sour-faced old serving man and at once a high-pitched voice called out from somewhere inside come in come in isabel i saw you get out of that ramshackle old hack what are the minturns coming to a boston terrier rushed at them barking fiercely then fawned on them in the friendliest fashion and a tiny king charles spaniel bow wowed in a way that made betty say it sounded like a woolly store dog and take him up in her arms where he snuggled down contentedly that's my grand-aunt miss minturn said in a low voice as they walked towards the room indicated by the servant they were ushered into a drawing-room which for size betty had not seen equaled even at the pines or at miss minturn's home on washington square long wide and high ceilinged it was carpeted with old aubusson the walls were a plain pale gray against which were gracefully outlined beautiful belter rosewood chairs while two sofas covered with the same delightfully faded rose-colored damask reposed at each end of the room rosewood tables and inlaid cabinets the furniture for which the rich before the sixties forfeited their colonial and revolutionary pieces stood like pygmies on the rose-strewn carpet of this vast room as they entered betty caught a glimpse of herself in a distant pier-glass in this handsome yet cheerless room gave her an odd feeling of separation from her own personality at one end of the room betty saw miss minturn's grand-uncle and grand-aunt the old gentleman was tall thin and aristocratic with a mild and pleasant face his snowy dundreary whiskers setting off a complexion that was as pink and delicate as a girl's at one side lay his boston terrier and the spaniel leaped at once from betty's arms and ensconced himself at the other side betty sat down beside him when she had gone through the empty formality of an introduction to the old lady for it was very soon evident that wherever she stood or sat remained space to madame minturn fascinated however betty could not take her eyes from her sitting there in the corner of the sofa her back straight as a ramrod a great paisley shawl thrown over her knees and a chudder over her shoulders 
peering out from the midst of the handsome draperies was a tiny withered brown face with piercing eyes surrounded by a large lace cap ornamented with cherry-colored ribbons well you're here at last isabel i should like to know what brought you the old lady demanded imperiously in a shrill treble shaking a hitherto concealed ebony cane at her grandniece i have been asking you to come for six months or more grandaunt you forget that i'm a very busy woman miss minturne reminded her you needn't scream isabel i'm not deaf said the old lady then with no effort to lower her own voice she asked who is that you brought with you miss minturne said something about betty helping her in her work a working girl she examined betty curiously for a moment the flamboyant ribbons bobbed closer to miss minturne and betty felt herself dwindle once more into an object without dimension color or form mr minturne however made amends by smiling benignly and nodding his white head towards the dogs and telling betty about their tricks but evidently he annoyed his wife for she bade him be quiet whispering to miss minturne that he was a little childish as betty was now shut out of the conversation she had an excellent opportunity to look around her that gave her exquisite pleasure for miss minturne had told her that the house was more than a hundred and fifty years old and had been a centre of revolutionary history in spite of its run-down condition and gloomy atmosphere it had the charm of refined traditions a background of past lives and histories that captivated betty's antiquarian and historical spirit it was spoken of as the great house she had discovered at the station it stood in the centre of an estate of two hundred acres or more with a far-reaching vista over the hilltops and commanded the valley like a fort the high foundation wall and the massive square chimneys accented its military aspect betty's eyes travelled from the windows back to the room the portraits on the walls were as awe-inspiring as the old lady except one which hung directly opposite the old man's chair it was the modern portrait of a young man and after a close look betty was sure she could understand why mr minturne sat in front of that frank handsome face even in the old gentleman's wrinkled forehead could still be traced the lines that made the young man's head so distinguished the square jaw and the lips sunken yet firm were reproduced spiritedly in the portrait in the young face there was missing the mildness of the venerable man and in the old one the vitality and spirit of the youth both were serious though betty fancied she saw repeated in the portrait and its eyes seemed to look straight into hers the pleasant whimsical smile that the old man turned on her whenever his wife made one of her characteristically sharp speeches i see you were wondering who that handsome young fellow is said mr minturne softly gently stroking his dundreries it's a face to make one wonder that said betty he looks so so ready she felt that this could not mean much to her listener but that had been the conclusion of her thoughts there he stood the man equal to any occasion social or financial military or diplomatic he's our only grandson he's in the diplomatic service he's only twenty-five that's young to have so much responsibility he gave a side glance at his wife but seeing that there was no probability of their being interrupted he went on he's coming home this summer i wish he could be here while you are with us he's been in scotland lately has a place there sort of a shooting box but he's a true american he hastened to add he's not one of those who find other countries more to his liking than his own he stopped and looked proudly into the open pleasant face i wonder now he continued slowly why so many of our young lads nowadays have such square jaws and square shoulders too betty smiled but the jaws couldn't be tailor-made nor dentist-made supplemented the old gentleman with a quiet chuckle in which betty joined discreetly with a quick glance at madame minturne who fortunately was talking in a high key i served all through the war he mused 
and i don't think many of us had such a fighting expression as he has he nodded towards the portrait betty looked critically at the picture but his eyes are so kind and laughing that at first one doesn't notice the awful determination of his mouth you've hit the nail on the head my dear awful determination expresses it exactly he holds on like a bulldog that's the only way to get through these days said betty with a wise shake of her sunny head her face full of sad wisdom and feeling herself the contemporary of the man of threescore and ten as there filed through her mind one venture and its failure then another and another madame minturne did not give betty even a nod when she left the drawing-room for the night miss minturne and her granduncle remained for an hour or so to play cribbage for old mr minturne had passed light-heartedly from a youth of frolic to an old age of cards betty found a book and passed the remainder of the evening pleasantly enough on going to her room she threw herself into a chair and with elbows on her knees her chin sunk deep in her palms began to think of her predicament an ignored guest i knocked but you didn't answer so i came right in had to be careful for my grand-aunt can hear a pin drop whispered miss minturne closing the door softly in the moonlight she could see betty's downcast attitude it's my grand-aunt betty isn't it betty sprang up and juggled the unobservant miss minturne into the easiest chair in the room yes she acknowledged reluctantly she drew a stool to miss minturne's side your aunt doesn't want me here because i am a working girl and she has ignored me completely you mustn't mind her dear miss minturne spoke with the indifference of one whose mind was on her own troubles i confess that i'm more than half afraid of her myself but she's an interesting character after all on account of my uncle robert i come to see her as often as i can he loves cards and i devote my evenings to playing with him he's only a month older than grandaunt ellen but she insists that he's much older and that he's growing childish pride has been her ruling passion pride of ancestry of wealth of position of beauty and she has never forgiven me for going into trade as she puts it you're in trade too my dear so you're snubbed betty drew herself up why should she stay there only to be snubbed this question was on the end of her tongue when miss minturne laughed guardedly aunt ellen will simply ignore you she did me for a whole year after i went into trade she added easily if cousin lawrence were only here he's splendid that's the word he's my ideal of a man he has a lot of fun in him too during a pause in the conversation there came from the next room a low monotone as of someone reading grandaunt evidently is not asleep yet she has a companion to read to her from the bible it's always the bible and she makes her continue the reading even when she drops off into a doze the monotonous drone stopped then they heard madame minturne's shrill voice berating her companion there i caught you you stopped reading when you thought i was asleep how often must i tell you manning that i want you to keep right on whether i'm asleep or not miss minturne and betty involuntarily smiled into each other's eyes miss minturne perhaps a trifle cynically while betty's face clouded with pity and concern for the unfortunate companion it won't last much longer she reads only until eleven one thing betty laughed miss minturne consolingly you have seen a grand dame high-tempered and imperious penurious and inconsiderate yet after all with the fascination of conscious power the way one feels about napoleon and an old age no one could envy she's certainly an interesting character admitted betty dubiously the picture miss minturne presented failed to correspond with her ideas of the great ladies of the past now enjoy my grand-aunt said miss minturne genially rising and kissing betty good-night miss minturne certainly overrates my capacity for enjoyment said betty to herself as the door closed End of chapter 10 recording by holly jensen
Chapter Eleven of Betty Baird's Golden Year by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Eleven. Betty meets young Mister Minturn. While Betty was dressing the next morning, she thought over the events of the day and evening before, and she wished from the bottom of her heart that she could pay for her dinner and be free from obligation to her unwilling hostess why that old lady is as bad as miriam and caroline were at the pines she exclaimed brushing her hair so vigorously that the ivory brush was glittering with many golden spirals betty felt indeed as if she had returned to those days in the boarding-school where unknown and poorly dressed she had excited the same feeling of snobbishness in the minds of some of the rich girls now it's a woman of eighty think of it eighty and because i'm a working girl betty shook her head wonderingly puzzled beyond the depth of her girlish understanding of human nature eighty and not to see any more clearly than girls of sixteen while mr minturn had been courteous and friendly she felt that she would not be a guest until mrs minturn had shown her ordinary civility betty could not deceive herself into believing that old age was the cause of madame minturn's ignoring her she had shown plainly and unmistakably that she would disregard every business friend of that eccentric niece of hers who knew everybody betty had heard her say the evening before such a proud old lady said betty half aloud her eyes still seeing the quaint old figure sitting stiffly erect on the great sofa enveloped in its shawls and the lace cap decorated with cherry-colored ribbons all awry so old she looked across the valley to where the sun was breaking through the delicate pearly clouds above the hilltops tipping them with red and the whole countryside was wakening and stirring and flickering in the perfect june morning but betty's eyes were still on the old madam i should think such old people would have more serious things to think about she felt that old age itself should be the cure for all levity and faults she turned from the window and with a last look into the mirror to see that her hair was neat and her belt in place she walked downstairs betty's healthy young thoughts now began to turn to breakfast yet she felt she could not eat another meal under this inhospitable roof she was in a quandary miss minturn had told her that her uncle and aunt always had their morning coffee and rolls in their own rooms and as she was very tired she would follow their example and that betty should not wait for her no one would miss her thought betty and she decided at once that she'd walk down to the crossroads and find her breakfast at the tiny shop she had noticed there as she drove up to the manor house what would my mother think if she knew that my hostess had not said good night to me if i were only like mother sighed betty she says a lady can never be insulted but i can't fold my hands i must fly off and do something when things are horrid usually it could be said of betty as the impulsive colonial governor burnett said of himself i act first and think afterwards she walked briskly down the broad yellow road lined with venerable trees youthful looking in their budding foliage if she weren't so old well i'll just have to grin and bear it as jack says only i think if it keeps up very long i'll be like the cheshire cats nothing but my grin will be left at the store she bought fresh rolls and a glass of milk and had a really picnicky breakfast the shop was kept by a pleasant old countrywoman who looked at betty with unconcealed admiration and curiosity have you a room here which you could rent me for the night asked betty abruptly bless your heart ain't you the young lady i seen goin up to the great house yesterday yes but there isn't room enough for me said betty impulsively adding to herself hotly no not enough room to breathe in betty's indignation kindled anew at every thought of remaining under madame minturn's roof i didn't know as how they had so much company up there muttered the old woman evidently puzzled at so many guests having passed her shop without being seen must have come at night but i didn't hear em this reason was painfully unsatisfactory to the old gossip 
but had to content her until her daughter a maid at the manor should come down at nightfall and tell all the news of the house betty was quite unconscious of her perplexity this has been a delicious breakfast she said smiling down at the old shopwoman bent with age and work who was like a child by the tall girl's side please let me come to-night a course of course she replied a bell above the door tinkled and a customer came in as betty went out she almost stumbled over a little girl who was playing with a rag doll on the doorstep she chatted with her for a few moments then walked light-heartedly back towards the manor house her spirit keyed up to its old blithesomeness by the bracing air the songs of the early birds the dainty breakfast and by the relief that came with the knowledge that now she would no longer be obliged to tax an inhospitable hospitality as she walked back however at times slowly then more hurriedly to keep pace with her thoughts there came suddenly the deciding light that so often comes quite unexpectedly after a long pursuit and with no apparent association with previous ideas why she could not do this thing it would surely hurt miss minturn who was kindness and goodness and lovableness itself oh she would not hurt her for all the proud old ladies in the world no nor for all the proud young hearts in the world either it came to her forcefully that pride and resentment should give way before love why what has become of my golden rule asked betty smiling to herself as a man might ask for his compass when lost in the woods i determine never never to remember mr webby and now here's my first chance for a new start and off i go if i could only remember in time she hurried back to the old storekeeper and recalled her engagement of the room she had paid for it in advance but as the woman seemed very poor betty refused to take back the money her second thoughts were apt to be rather expensive again she started for minturn manor pausing at one place to pick up a forlorn little mongrel pup that looked as if it had never before been held tenderly in human arms i fear puppy that you and i will never be noble characters she said smiling down brightly at the dog who put out a paw and touched her arm as delicately sympathetic as if he were a king charles spaniel i've wanted to be a noble character i've wanted to overcome resentment but it's awfully hard puppy isn't it the dog looked up into her laughing eyes with all the solemnity of pupdom which knows a thing or two especially that life is no laughing matter no matter what light-minded sunny-haired girls may think to the contrary i'll confide this to you puppy i am a noble character at least for the remainder of the day and i can now meet the lady of the manor though she won't know it with proper dignity it would be a pity if a truly noble character even if only a temporary one couldn't stand a little snubbing for a friend when she reached the entrance gate no one was to be seen and she stopped to survey the house anyway she thought with youthful inconsequence and pride the noble character momentarily in eclipse ours is almost as handsome as this and maybe this one has a mortgage on it too the mere thought made her feel a sudden warmth it would be impossible to be resentful towards people with a mortgage but the remembrance of what miss minturn had said about their wealth nipped that in the bud i'll try not to be beholden to them or to intrude on madam she said as she walked up the steps she stopped a moment to admire the exquisite old fan lights and i'll try to enjoy it all just then the dog slipped from her arms to bark wildly at the gardener who was coming around the corner of the house betty made her way into the drawing-room hoping that miss minturn had come down but found it deserted save by the sunbeams that played on the beautiful old carpet she could not resist making a curtsey to the portraits as she walked around examining the quaint gowns of the ladies and the plum-colored coats and yellow or scarlet waistcoats of the men finally she came to the one opposite which she had sat the evening before the portrait of the grandson 
madame minturne's discourtesy had so discolored things that betty could not now see the portrait in the pleasing light she had when she talked about it with the loving grandfather now as she looked at it there came back to her a sentiment she had heard madame minturne express with great emphasis in her conversation with miss minturne i'd be perfectly willing to be a lady jane grey to be queen for a day would you be willing to be beheaded to be king for just one day betty demanded of the portrait in an undertone the frank blue eyes smiled reassuringly back into her dark ones even then betty forgot the grandfather's words my grandson is a true american i am not at all sure of you young man she continued smiling oh you're good-looking i'll grant that betty turned to look out of the window the blue eyes followed her she looked back but you have your grandmother's high nose she found a sort of defiant pleasure in speaking aloud for the room was still dominated by the spirit of madame minturne her hands were loosely clasped behind her back and the sunbeams found congenial places to play hide-and-seek in her golden-brown hair making the halo that little dotty had once called a hoop like the ladies in the picture as she pointed to the madonna and betty's hoop had become a playful household word in the baird home indeed the same hoop had caused a poetic youth one of jack's harvard chums to liken her to aurora the morning being rather cool betty had put on her simple white flannel dress and in her belt she had stuck a bunch of crimson roses if the poetic junior had been there he no doubt would have said some sophomoric thing about rosy aurora for her face was bright and beautiful and glowing with perfect health she stood before the portrait for some time waiting for miss minturne then she gave it a last look saying in a low voice but with a distinctness that her pent-up feelings gave snob this was her final decision regarding the perplexing face and she turned away determined not to be pleased with a minturn turned away so abruptly that she precipitated herself almost into the arms of why gasped betty springing back in confusion looking from the man into whose arms she had nearly fallen to the portrait no i didn't step down from my frame he said courteously yet smiling like a man who enjoyed a joke though really now don't you think that cruel word might produce just such a result oh exclaimed betty the blood crimsoning her face pardon me i didn't know she could not finish the sentence and stood quiet hoping for some way out of the predicament then with a flash despite her feeling of awkwardness she said i don't feel that even that word would justify your haunting anyone no queried the stranger as if considering an abstruse problem young mr minturne did not continue for betty had walked towards the window contriving while listening courteously to put the damper of finality on the conversation simply by a few steps there was silence betty gazed out of the window and tried to think and the youthful diplomat discovered that his tact was not in this emergency up to its mark so this is the scion thought betty as all her friends knew betty loved a coincidence and reserved certain pages in her commonplace book for those from her own life or from the life of others that she knew were authentic and here was a coincidence that seemed to her to outrank any in the marble-covered book betty stared unseeingly into the garden mr minturne remained standing where she had left him gazing fatuously at his own portrait why it was miss minturne's blessed voice why she repeated with inspiration and expiration of surprise as she hastened down the length of the room it's lawrence minturne himself minturne swung around at the sound of her voice isabel he hurried forward and grasped her hands in his the scion loves miss minturne i can tell that by his voice said betty to herself and the scion went up some pegs in her estimation why what is betty baird doing standing with her back to the room exclaimed miss minturne isn't this delightful 
lawrence has stolen a march on us here he is and here am i such a pleasant coincidence miss minturne hurried on she stepped to the sofa and pulled betty down beside her characteristically miss minturne was so wholly charmed with this meeting with a cousin she admired that she did not at once notice any constraint in betty or mr minturne when they were seated minturne sat opposite his portrait though it seemed to exert an unpleasant influence over him it attracted him against his will to study it to see just why this stranger should label it as she had miss minturne talked animatedly with her cousin who got up abruptly and turned his back on the portrait leaning against the mantelpiece and looking down at them this gave betty time to think out a plan for luncheon she decided to go out for a walk and get lost no that would not do for miss minturne would be worried oh she had an engagement to lunch with the old woman down the road as she heard madame minturne coming downstairs betty explained rather incoherently to miss minturne that she would not be back for luncheon and slipped from the house end of chapter eleven recording by holly jensen Chapter Twelve of Betty Baird's Golden Year by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Twelve: A Gay Luncheon in the Little Shop. Betty chatted gaily with the old woman in the little shop while she sat in a Windsor chair at a table by a window overlooking the deep valley which the winding river had cut for itself the shop was perched on the very edge of the precipitous hill suspended dizzily like a bird-cage in a mass of green the day was cool yet balmy and all sorts of green things were shooting up it was all young and all blithe and the blue sky bent over the earth in a beneficent arch the trees stood silent yet it seemed to betty that their silence was voluntary a restful reserve that the babbling run might well imitate the shopkeeper's grandchild forefinger in mouth came hesitatingly into the room betty caught her and with merry ado tied a bright ribbon on her hair and a tiny one around the thick grimy neck of gwendolen the rag doll she held in her arms this last favor quite won the child through her maternal pride and she began to talk freely by the time luncheon was ready betty and her small friend were exchanging confidences on dolls and betty insisted on her eating luncheon with her that their conversation might continue without interruption while they were enjoying the hot biscuits which had been brought in nestling in snowy napkins the savory smells of baking floated in from the back room the pup which had rushed from his home as betty passed and followed her barking and capering to the shop now had his share in the luncheon through the open window came the voices of a multitude of birds singing cheerily as they built their homes in the surrounding trees above them all she could hear the glorious notes of two wood thrushes from a small pine tree across the road betty's cheeks glowed in the fresh air that swept into the window from across the hills and deep ravines isn't it beautiful she exclaimed turning to the storekeeper ain't it she agreed and them wood robins do sing so sweet she fingered betty's flannel dress curiously and soon they grew to such intimacy that she asked betty its price and all the secrets of its workmanship how nice really human people are thought betty happily now i must go she said looking at the clock and finding that the manor house luncheon hour had passed i've had a splendid time she hurried away with the dog at her heels the poor mongrel wanted to play and frisked and danced until she picked up a stick and threw it far down the road where he put after it with a wild rush bringing it back and laying it at her feet and begging with eyes and wagging tail and wriggling body for another chance when she reached the house she waved him homeward and walked up the pathway and sank down on the low steps she heard voices in the drawing-room and decided to wait outside until miss minturne should see her 
she had carried the third volume of lockhart's life of sir walter scott with her and she began to read it feeling something tug at her dress she found that the pup had come back and was lying at her side having selected with fine discrimination the soft hem of her white skirt she closed her book and commenced patting him for she could not fix her mind on the wonderful life the memory of a startling page of her own life possessed her try as she would she could not throw off the incident of the portrait with a young girl's inconsequence she felt incensed at young mr minturn though what he had done she could not in all fairness put into words that would soothe the memory of her own rudeness she knew that his only offence was in being quite blamelessly of course madame minturn's grandson over against this damaging relationship there flashed before her his courtesy and fine bearing in a ridiculous predicament with a mirthless smile betty said to herself that she could well believe that he was not in the habit of finding girls standing before his portrait and addressing it with an explosive expletive betty knew that if it had been a girl she would have stayed through thick and thin to apologize but to apologize to a young self-possessed elegant man of the world madame minturn's grandson at the idea of meeting him again her cheeks tingled with mortification now i'll have to go home miss minturn or not how ephemeral my noble character has been betty at a loss sighed with a smile that was a mixture of rue and humor the absurdity of the situation appealed to her in spite of everything just then young mr minturn came out on the porch and stood looking quizzically down at betty and the dog betty could not restrain a look of dismay i see you have made an interesting acquaintance observed minturn assuming a casual air and glancing from betty to the dog the dog returned his look unblinkingly then with unexpected vivacity jumped to mr minturn's feet and begged to be taken up why what a cur you are to treat a lady so you have execrable taste he declared i own up that i feel a little disappointed at his treatment smiled back betty with an effort when i graduated a forlorn little dog came up on the stage and sat on my train my first train while i was saying my most affecting farewell words you knew the wretch asked minturn laughing heartily at the story oh yes he always followed me when we took our constitutionals oh he's going to pass it over how fine she thought then she felt her position indefensible and uncourageous perhaps i should apologize for intruding said minturn and i must apologize began betty quickly and her unpremeditated apology slipped out i hope you didn't mind being called a i mean i really didn't mean that quite i was just in a bad humor it did betty good to hear minturn's laugh she joined in and in that happy appreciative laugh all embarrassment was lost his wholly unegotistic manner of putting aside something that had worried her even though it had touched his pride and his easy way of making a joke of it reconciled betty to even madame minturn's grandson while they were talking miss minturn came out and proposed a horseback ride as the old people had gone upstairs for their afternoon nap betty asked to be excused for she wanted to write to lois oh lois i have so much to tell you she wrote i am writing with that perfectly gorgeous fountain pen miss minturn gave me at christmas sitting on a rock under a willow that leans sentimentally over a real brook just like those in pictures i can see across the valley where there is a background of gray mist that with the greens and yellows of the trees makes it look like some of the old tapestries miss minturn has at the studio now if miss minturn and the scion would only ride through the valley on horseback they've just gone out on two splendid horses the scion is superb on horseback it would make me think far-fetched of the canterbury pilgrimage i described everything in my letter to my mother the house it's a love of a place mr minturn and madam and how i almost threw myself into the scion's arms 
you know i brought the third volume of lockhart's life of sir walter you ought to remember for you hooted at me for doing it and as i sat reading it on the portico with madame minturne's shrill voice mingling with sir walter's nightly words young mr minturne came out for a breath of air which his grandmother is deathly afraid of he apologized for his intrusion and i kindly forgave him for coming out on his own doorstep then he said something about being seated it was so far as i could make out for i was not wholly at my ease apologetic too diplomatic manners i suppose not at all like jack who sinks down gladly without invitation or compunction and rises painfully and reluctantly when at last politeness compels him and i apologized for snob and he was just splendid about it but i'll tell you everything when i see you oh lois he loves scott as much as i do he knows every inch of scotland we had a glorious conversation i've never heard any one talk as he did i told him about the little boy who came into the silver lining library and asked me for the lay of the last minstrel show by scott you should have heard him laugh he's one of those who can laugh heartily over a silly little thing and that makes you feel so easy and comradely well somehow you know lois i felt madame's black eyes piercing my vertebrae just then i turned around and there she was peeking out of the window at us now i'm going out for a walk then i'll come back and finish this i've just come back from the little shop and i'm eating some splendiferous cookies i found there you should have heard the way madame minturne said when i was introduced to her a working girl but i am glad i am a working girl i think so often about lucy larcombe's book where she tells of those splendid lowell girls who fifty years ago worked in the factories there in order to send their brothers to college and they did it oh why can't i help about our mortgage tomorrow we're going home and i'm glad but i do hate to think of the endless commuting i wouldn't have mother know that for the world yet i hate the thought that i hate it more than i hate it for it seems ungrateful to complain when one is as well off as i am however the atmosphere here is especially salubrious for grievances by the way the scion is an old friend of the king's and he says he believes he will visit them this summer so you will meet him end of chapter twelve recording by holly jensen chapter thirteen of betty baird's golden year by anna hamlin weichel this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter 13 The Fire. Betty's eyes flew open, and in an instant she was wide awake. She did not know why. She was not conscious of having heard anything, yet she had been sleeping soundly, and all at once she was fully awake. She lay still, listening intently she could not hear a sound except the whir and clank of the manor windmill the stamping of the horses in the stable and the distant baying of a hound through the broad windows at her right she could dimly make out the tall trees swaying gently in the light breeze she strained her eyes into the dark corners of her room but could see nothing i'm growing nervous she thought she smiled to herself at repeating the familiar formula for in her young healthy life she thought of nerves about as older people do of second childhood feeling wide awake however she decided that a change might enable her to get to sleep more quickly so she got out of bed and knelt at the broad sill of the low window looking out into the peaceful night and at the friendly stars twinkling overhead suddenly it seemed to her that she detected the faint smell of burning she leaned out of the window and listened intently she thought she could hear a faint crackling at the direction of the stable with every nerve on edge she turned towards it then she noticed that the horses were stamping excitedly staring fixedly at one of the stable windows she saw a flickering light evidently from a fire her heart jumped and a lump came to her throat oh those beautiful horses she cried aloud she sprang to her feet hurried into her kimono and slippers 
and ran to miss minturne's room and knocked at the door gently but decidedly miss minturne opened the door at once don't be frightened miss minturne said betty with forced calm but i fear the stable is on fire we must keep it from the old people returned miss minturne in an agitated whisper run and waken the servants and i'll call cousin lawrence betty flew upstairs and aroused the servants then down again to the first floor going through the dining-room to get out by the side door she heard the clock in the hall chime two as she ran across the lawn to the fence that divided it from the garden the flames broke through the upper windows of the stable just then the rear door of the house was flung open and minturne dashed out closely followed by the servants in line to pass buckets he shouted instantly miss minturne betty the coachman the butler the cook and the housemaids formed a line passing the buckets from the pump to the stable and back again keep it up i'll get the horses out called minturne betty's heart gave a leap then stood still she saw him dash to the stable door tear it open and spring in and close it after him it seemed ages before it was hurled back and minturne came out leading one of the terrified carriage horses which he had blindfolded with a blanket slamming the door behind him he trotted the horse swiftly around to the front of the house and tied him to a tree back to the stable he ran and brought out the others one by one then the roof fell in with a roar and the heat grew intolerable the bucket passers were driven back the wind's carrying sparks over on the house we have to throw water on the roof cried minturne he quickly planted the ladder against the porch and clambered up stand on the ladder pat and hand up the buckets if only we had some help he exclaimed pulling up a bucket without waiting to hear more betty gathered up her kimono and ran down the walk to the gate she recalled instantly the alarm box at the crossroads just beyond the old woman's shop down the highway she flew her hair streaming out behind her in the rising wind her lithe figure bore up splendidly against its force her light steps fell evenly on the clay road running was no new thing to betty all her life she had loved it and battling with the wind in her excitement she cried fire fire though there was no one to hear there were few stars to be seen and the moon was often obscured by clouds fire fire she cried over and over between panting breaths and vibrating through the half-articulate cry was the thought of minturne what a masterful man in a few minutes she reached the little shop the old woman's head bobbed out of an upper window what's on fire she screamed the stable cried betty not slackening her speed how did it get a fire she shrieked after her leaning far out on the window sill betty did not stop a moment more and she found herself at the alarm box without hesitation she broke in the glass door with her bare hand and gave the hook a vigorous jerk instantly she heard the awesome clang of the great bell in the village tower feeling then the strain of her long run she sank down trembling by the roadside soon she heard the rapid beating of a gong and the shrill tooting of a whistle and a fire engine and a hose cart thundered by the powerful gray horses straining against their collars as they plunged along the engine shooting a stream of sparks high into the air i must get back to the house maybe i can help she said aloud she stood up then with a little cry of pain she sank back to the ground her slippers were gone and her feet sadly cut and bruised in the excitement she had not noticed it before with great difficulty she hobbled to the old woman's shop there was a light in the front room for the son had gone to help at the fire and his mother was sitting by the window waiting for his return with the news why i thought you was a ghost she exclaimed starting from her chair as betty came up come in child you done your duty all right why what a mercy does this mean she cried as she saw betty's bleeding hand and feet 
an hour later the fire engine and the hose cart jogged past then the sun came back the fire was out the old manor house was safe betty had been missed and they were searching for her here comes master lawrence now said the son mr scarborough has fetched him in his automobile minturne leaped out and came to the door of the shop betty tried to hurry forward to meet him the old woman had lent her her number seven slippers but the bandages which the good old soul had wound around her lacerated feet made the size a matter of little consequence as betty stood in the doorway the light from the bracket lamp behind her cast fantastic shadows on the furrowed clay road outside with her blue kimono rumpled and torn her beautiful hair falling down her back in a tangled mass and caught with leaf and briar and the big carpet slippers projecting from beneath her short gown she made a picture that strangely mingled the humorous with the pathetic she stood there unable to speak but immensely relieved to learn from the sun that the engine arrove in the nick of time to save the house minturne hastened to her and took her uninjured hand in both of his how can i thank you how can i thank you he repeated if i hadn't been so worried about the house i'd have had only an exciting adventure said betty withdrawing her hand from his and leaning against the door frame she was beginning to feel very weak i didn't do a thing but run and smash a little she added smiling and i like to do both at times you ran and smashed to a good purpose tonight," said minturne warmly joining absently in betty's joke it was a mighty plucky thing and i can never thank you enough betty was about to answer when the two boat-like slippers caught her eyes and she began to laugh then she reeled minturne caught her in his arms calling for water the shopkeeper came running with a tin cup of water and dashed it into her face in a moment betty was herself it was nothing more than faintness from fatigue in spite of her protests minturne picked her up and carried her to the car mr scarborough and the old woman helping to tuck her in among the soft lap robes as they were speeding along betty asked in a faint voice yet with a note of her old-time mischievousness running through it mr minturne will you make an affidavit that i fainted minturne turned with a look of wonder he thought she was feverish from the excitement oh i'm in my right mind she affirmed my schoolmate lois bird and i used to want to faint she said she thought it was so ladylike she had a famous aunt who always fainted at the sight of a mouse but we could never manage it now i've gone and done it minturne laughed the heroine what's her name of the children of the abbey couldn't have done it more completely i'll back you up in any boast you make thank you i've learned though that faints like a good many other things can come a moment too late i don't feel the rapture i would have felt at fourteen they laughed at the nonsense minturne was relieved to see her in such good spirits while betty talked to make light of the incident as they were nearing the house they went very slowly a stream of people was returning from the fire having remained until the last ember had died out silence followed their words there was the sound of the brook that ran moonlight white through the darkling trees and cool reedy passes its bright rhythm staccatoing against the low indefinable whir of insects dawn was breaking in the east and in the half-light minturne's face with its smoky marks its stern strong lines appeared to betty to belong to a different age far off and strange the silence was not broken again except by minturne's and mr scarborough's questions as to how she felt until they reached the manor when miss minturne took betty off to rest end of chapter thirteen recording by holly jensen chapter fourteen of betty baird's golden year by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen 
chapter fourteen miss jane arrives betty had just attributed a new mood to their dear old home it's purring yes she said looking lovingly at the revolutionary house lying low on the fresh green grass a southerly breeze rippling its vines it makes me think of a big white cat basking in the sunlight it's the picture of comfort mrs baird demurred at her figure it always seems rather selfish for a cat to take the softest and warmest spot this dear old house is generous and would take everyone under its wing it's more like a motherly white hen i agree with you mrs baird lois put in and betty and i are happy chicks to be under its wing and edwina too she added looking over to the side terrace where the set was playing little sally waters and london bridge is breaking down their pleasant lazy snatches of conversation were broken into by jack's familiar whistle followed by a rollicking shanty in the chorus of which a number of stentorian voices joined betty shaded her eyes and looked expectantly at the launch which was steaming rapidly towards their little dock there are jack dunny and yes it is mr minturn she said she glanced around hastily to see if things were presentable mr minturn was visiting the kings and had called several times at boxwood but he was still company there so betty rejoiced that he had not found her with the big gingham apron in which she helped with the luncheon dishes covering her pretty blue dress this apron was a familiar sight to jack who had more than once volunteered to don it and take betty's place lois hastily smoothed invisible creases out of her white linen that was not only exquisitely dainty but superlatively becoming as dunmore lane's eyes were quick to perceive i've just come from the city said minturn as they came up fanning themselves with their panamas and this makes me wish i'd never have to see a city again it's a living sort of place isn't it all day i have felt like stroking it said betty and she told him about their discussion of its mood it's a great contrast to the place i have come from for here you see something charming everywhere you look minturn declared i took luncheon with friends who have gone to housekeeping in an apartment uptown the street is good enough but their dining-room is in the rear and poor peggy is training herself in the art of not seeing she has all her dining-room chairs standing with their backs towards the windows she can't shut out the view with curtains for she needs the light it takes experience and talent to see new york said mrs baird smilingly but i must say that the churches there seem more beautiful than anywhere else perhaps it's the contrast there's another thing about the city that never loses its interest to me and that's the patches of sky at the end of the long avenues especially just after sunset by the way miss baird he added slyly turning to betty in scotland where your eagles live it's all beautiful of course this hit set them all off now really honestly mr minturn did you ever see my eagles in scotland pleaded betty entering into the joke often minturn assured her and you'd enjoy the wild tales the people tell there about werewolves and witches america's badly off in the matter of folklore oh but you forget our indian tales and as to witches we've had them protested betty stoutly we won't have salem run down that way will we mother all our ancestors came from there ah that accounts for your witchery mistress betty laughed minturn bowing betty gave him a derisive smile which the same are a wary proper remark punned jack and there are others aren't there dunny old man he added bowing to lois well i should say so agreed dunny with fervor come on lois i want to give merrylegs some sugar and i need help dunny's love for the pony had lately been waxing stronger and stronger if one could judge from the amount of sugar he fed him and lois's encouragement of his affection was not lost on betty and when it wasn't the pony it was something else 
they had grown into the habit of going off together to see something betty thought the thing usually rather indefinite some distance from the others hello here comes pharaoh's chariot cried jack looking down the road an old hack rattled up to the gate company coming betty he asked with a quizzical smile for this particular hack was the standing joke its wheels tended to immobility of the village betty and her mother looked surprised i can't imagine who it is said mrs baird in a low voice as betty sprang up no one has written the hack door flew back on its creaking hinges the individual within could not be seen but an immense old-fashioned bandbox covered with landscape paper bundles of all sizes and shapes wrapped in newspapers a capacious market basket a huge brownish umbrella and a carpet bag that bloomed like a bed of peonies rejected one after another from the ancient vehicle then a pair of prunella gaiters overtopped by some inches of white stockings started nimbly down the steps of the hack at the sight of the familiar prunellas betty sped down to the gate calling back over her shoulder mother mother it's dear miss jane mrs baird hurried after her her face alight with surprise and welcome the eruption of parcels had sent jack rolling with laughter on the grass but at betty's joyful cry he straightened up hastily and said to minturne i guess i put my foot in it that time minturne's eyes however were following betty and with an i think we can help out there he strode towards the group at the gate where betty was hugging miss jane while mrs baird having quietly paid the driver began to disentangle her from the luggage that strewed her path let me take that please mrs baird called out minturne springing forward as she stooped for a bundle betty took the huge landscape bandbox from her mother and demurely handed it to the elegant diplomat oh this is a mere trifle he said blandly as he took it give me some more thank you replied betty but first you must meet one of my oldest and dearest friends miss huffnagel of weston pennsylvania miss jane this is mr minturne mr minturne bowed low over his bandbox while miss jane studied him with the unblinking curiosity of a countrywoman who has come to the city determined to see all the sights then she extended a long mittened hand to him pleased to meet ye but what might the young man's name be betty i'm gettin a leetle deef she leaned forward with her hand behind her ear mr minturne betty called out ha huh, never heerd no sich name before muttered miss jane as she walked briskly towards the house betty why ain't you wrote me about this perlite young man you certainly wrote enough about brooks demanded miss jane in her sharp voice as they reached the porch betty instinctively turned towards minturne to see whether he had heard he was looking straight at her and met her stolen glance with a look that was an unstudied admixture of reproach with amusement i'm a blameless listener but i have the reward of the unscrupulous one he said in answer to betty's half-startled smile betty arched her eyebrows skeptically then turned to miss jane though with considerably heightened color what would mr minturne think miss jane had spoken as though jack had filled her letters and what different feelings she heard miss jane speaking oh i beg your pardon miss jane what were you saying she asked hurriedly miss jane did not answer but scanned her face questioningly humph what miss jane betty tried to fasten her mind on the dear old friend i said humph betty had a sense that the world had begun to whirl most unaccountably if miss jane saw something she didn't see and yes she did wish miss jane hadn't said that about dear old jack how suddenly he had become dear old jack she did not take time to think jack was presented in due form and received a more cordial greeting as miss jane had become familiar with his name through betty's letters for she had a pennsylvania dutch woman's natural reserve 
and in addition the distrust of strangers of a woman who has lived all her life in a rustic community edwina came running around the house to see who had arrived and miss jane met this important new member of the household with the apparently sceptical hope that she was a good leetle girl much to edwina's surprise so far in her life visitors had happily taken that for granted now dear miss jane let me show you to your room you must be tired after your long trip suggested mrs baird tired shucks said miss jane crisply i done a batch of bread before sun-up and i feel spry as a kitten they heard her answer as she mounted the steps to her room so that's miss jane well she's a peach said jack she ran me through with that sharp look of hers she's a grand woman said betty gravely a heroine she's been a seamstress all her life in a narrow valley on the susquehanna she supported her father and mother while they lived her father was doleless and her mother poorly as they say there then she helped her sister who had a drunken husband and a lot of children she's never complained and she'd be insulted if you said a word to her about her self-sacrifice she always tried to make people believe that her father was poorly too and couldn't work she never mentioned her brother-in-law oh she's full of pride bully for miss jane jack cried admiringly for he felt that he already knew her well from betty's talk about her she's certainly a brave one exclaimed minturn i hope i shall become well acquainted with her it's unusual to find such characters nowadays no doubt there are many of them but i haven't happened to run across them she'll make it lively enough for you warned betty laughing at her memories of miss jane's sharp tongue you'll not have a failing that she won't hold up to you yet all the time you'll feel that it's not malicious in the slightest it may sound conceited laughed back minturn but all you say only makes me more eager to know her better i wish she'd hurry and come down said jack she really doesn't need an hour to take off even that coal scuttle bonnet and i'll bet she's not the kind to lie down in the afternoon you may be sure she isn't i don't know just what she may be doing but probably she's insisting on helping my mother at something or other from all you have told me about miss jane said minturn thoughtfully i should judge her to be a good deal like professor waite of oxford when professor freeman was once asked what professor waite was doing he replied i don't know but i should suppose he is sitting in his chair thinking how he can do some kind act to someone or else doing it end of chapter fourteen Recording by Holly Jensen Chapter 15 of Betty Baird's Golden Year by Anna Hamlin Weichel This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen Chapter 15 The Twine Wash Rag Presently, Miss Jane and Mrs. Baird came out on the veranda. Although a woman of sixty, miss jane had all the vivid interest in life of a young girl and now in the home of the people she loved and in whose friendship she felt secure she was experiencing a traveller's delight in new sights and surroundings her tall gaunt figure clad in rusty bombazine was replete with nervous energy her gray hair was gathered into a tight little knot at the back of her small head a pair of iron-rimmed spectacles surmounted her rather sharp nose she walked spryly to the top of the steps and looking over the rims of her spectacles called briskly beckoning with her lean forefinger lisbeth come here onct betty flew over to her and taking the low steps two at a time was at her side in an instant here's something for you it ain't worth nothin but you was so fond of your bead necklace when you was a little girl that i made this for you miss jane handed her a bead reticule which she had worked with many an elaborate and painstaking stitch it was a perfect copy of a century-old bag charmingly designed in dull colors and was not unlike those that were being carried by well-bred girls at the dictates of fickle fashion 
oh miss jane it's beautiful and you made it for me betty threw her young arms around the spare rigid shoulders kissing her again and again though as usual where miss jane was concerned betty didn't know whether to laugh or to cry for though her deeds were so unselfish her manner was always positively threatening when she feared she was about to be thanked for them ach that ain't worth a row o shucks she pushed betty aside and thrusting her hand deep down into her skirt pocket drew out a twine wash rag i didn't have nothin for that perlite young man what helped me so i want her give him this here wash rag that red border won't run it's fast betty's eyes twinkled but she hesitated would it be fair to miss jane to allow her to put herself in a position that would make her appear ridiculous to people who did not understand her peculiarities and love them as they themselves did she knew that jack would understand for she and lois had told him a great deal about her but what of mr minturne betty's mouth grew firm he's a gentleman i know he'll understand she said to herself come miss jane she cried putting her hand in miss jane's arm let's give it to him right away miss jane would not budge i won't do no such thing child you give it to him betty walked towards mr minturne thoughtfully stretching out the wash rag then folding it to a neat little square she couldn't be quite sure of the wisdom of giving it yet she knew that miss jane would be disappointed if she could not in her favorite way acknowledge mr minturne's courtesy in carrying her parcels well it's time i trust him and i do was the way she summed up her cogitations with a characteristic dash of her hand over her bright hair as though she had smoothed all difficulties out of her mind minturne noticed that her usually merry face was grave and preoccupied by the way mr minturne she began lightly i think you must have second sight or is it plain insight like your professor waite she was thinking of something kind to do and it was for you miss jane is so grateful for your services that she asked me to give you this for a moment minturne looked down at the gift in his hand evidently mystified jack who had seen a succession of these wash rags come to the bairds from miss jane's kind and busy fingers recognized it at once and his eyes flashed mischievously then minturne made it out and with a pleased glance at betty he examined the fast dyed wash rag attentively well if that isn't about the nicest thing that has happened to me in many a long day he exclaimed and hurried over to miss jane i do thank you miss huffnagel he began but miss jane interrupted him determined to frustrate his efforts to thank her this here's an awful nice place ain't it is she looked admiringly around at the house and the garden betty came to the relief of mr minturne who was somewhat embarrassed by his first experience with the quaint pennsylvania dutch idiom and peculiar intonation oh miss jane you know lois is here don't you she and mr lane are feeding the pony let's go after them just then lois and dunny appeared and betty hurried to meet them oh lois guess who is here she cried but lois had spied miss jane's tall figure and was running towards her joining betty in her jubilations miss jane won't you come down to the wharf and see us off asked jack as he shook hands with her at the porch oh do let us go miss jane betty threw an arm around her waist and they hurried to a point that overlooked the landing miss jane stared wonderingly at the young men's duck suits and shook her head them white suits of theirn must make their mothers an awful wash ain't betty but i guess they must have hired girls to help em do em up she concluded brightening the two stood on the bank and waved farewells as the graceful launch started off once i rode on a packet boat on the canal i was leetle then just about knee-high to a grasshopper miss jane murmured i don't think them lunches half as nice as packets no indeed they ain't she added energetically looking after the handsome boat she turned and looked at betty who was watching the men jump from the launch to the king's yawl 
and whose eyes followed the yawl until the peak of the white sail showing a moment against the deep blue of the sky sank out of sight behind the golden sandbars miss jane paused then she added what she had not intended in the beginning as she observed betty's face the light in the dark eyes the exquisite color on the oval cheeks the wistful smile on the sweet lips i guess them lunches don't seem so nice because i ain't young no more yet she realized that youth had cast the same mysterious radiance over the pennsylvania canal boat that it was now throwing for betty over the trim yawl what did you say miss jane betty asked hugging her closely for miss jane had spoken under her breath nothin own up miss jane you feel exactly as i do said betty looking into the sharp blue eyes that were now a little misty i mean that i always feel sad when i see a boat pushing off and watch it sail towards the horizon and then suddenly disappear it's a farewell sort of a way i see you're still a high flyer lizbeth said miss jane testily she had no sympathy with sentiment or at least none that she was willing to show i guess a body can find a good bit in this world to make us sad that ain't moonshine and water and boats she took the sting from her words by patting betty's hand lovingly then exclaimed to hide her feelings my lizbeth how strubbled your hair is and she gently pushed back the fine loose curls betty laughed she wanted to tell miss jane that she had grown very practical but she didn't have the gift of ready self-excuse however miss jane helped her you always was fond of poetry but your mother says how you're right smart at figurin and been savin and countin your pennies that's right a penny saved is a penny earned but you're a good girl lizbeth she finished briskly as they started back towards the house for several days miss jane was silent as to her reasons for coming to boxwood that she came unexpectedly was not surprising as she loved surprises and moreover it was always the unexpected that happened where she was concerned but the fact that she had evidently come to stay a long time as her baggage indicated was puzzling gradually it leaked out that her two nephews were out of work and that miss jane's sewing days in weston were at an end a new and fashionable dressmaker with the sign madame bienvenue modes in large gold letters on her door had usurped the place so long held by miss jane no one wished for plain sewing now and the new dressmaker made all the weston gowns except the increasing number that were bought ready-made in philadelphia miss jane had come to seek work in the city it came out only in disconnected words and sentences for it was hard to break a lifelong habit of reticence abruptly miss jane had begun to ask for means of getting employment for herself and then for the little boys one of whom was eighteen the other nearing seventeen mrs baird and betty encouraged her heartily and promised to begin at once to try to find places for the nephews but they soon saw that her chief anxiety was to find work for herself to help rather than to be helped when they were alone betty turned to mrs baird why mother she hesitated while a look of gentle brooding came into her beautiful eyes why mother she repeated can it be that miss jane is superannuated a superannuated seamstress betty smiled a little at her unexpected alliteration then her eyes sought the floor in perplexity dear miss jane said gentle-hearted mrs baird lovingly it is good to see her i can find some work for her here in the village and she will be able to preserve her so dearly loved independence but she must first have a good long vacation which you know perfectly well she will never take mother darling but i think i can get places for the boys they are rather bright you know i went to school with one of them jack will help me and so will mr anstice your father says office boys are in great demand they can get six or seven dollars a week each and with their thrifty habits and their rent from the little home in weston i believe they can manage very well in less than a week betty had secured positions for both boys the older with jack at eight dollars per week 
the younger with mr anstice at seven there was promise of advancement in both places if they proved reliable which they certainly are for they are miss jane's nephews betty commented emphatically lois offered miss jane a loan to bring the two boys to new york but miss jane insisted that she had enough and in a short time the three began the task so new and strange to them of living in a tiny flat in the city to the boy's salary miss jane was able to add her own earnings as her exquisite plain sewing became known to the ladies of hobart through mrs baird and betty and with the rent money from weston they were soon receiving a considerable sum each month lois i have such a queer association of ideas said betty they were having their evening walk up and down under the firs and elms that bordered the path in front of the house you know that basement in our studio building is empty and miss minturn will rent it only to extraordinarily desirable people mr anstice laughs at her and says she will never rent it but she says she doesn't care she must have a neat-looking basement her studio demands artistic surroundings now since miss jane has come i can see in plain block letters on the basement door pennsylvania dutch cooking why betty exclaimed lois reproachfully do you think miss jane could run a restaurant miss jane no indeed but you know her sister is much younger and she is the best cook in all weston and it's the best kind of characteristic pennsylvania dutch cooking her coffee and coffee cake are just wonders you see coffee cake here of course but the real dutch article is as different from that as as from leather and her sponge cake and her schmierkasse and her apple butter and her raisin pies and her chicken pot pie now you know her daughters are dunkers and how cute and fetching they'd be as waitresses with immaculate close-fitting caps and enormous white aprons it would take i know it would exclaimed lois enthusiastically you must let me start them miss jane could not object to a business loan yes and miss minturn would let her have it for a low rent and she could depend on miss minturn's customers for patronage they often ask for some nice place then my father and i would be delighted to go there and there's a start when betty broached the plan the next day miss minturn was much pleased the windows could be neatly curtained in barred muslin she said and betty guaranteed that the place would be spotless with characteristic energy miss minturn and betty had mrs gomp miss jane's sister installed in short order the walls were tinted a delicate yellow and miss minturn lent her old brasses and coppers with blue platters to put on a narrow shelf forming a frieze around the room the fresh-faced dutch maidens with their stiffly starched caps and aprons made a bewitching picture framed in such appropriate surroundings for on the high old dresser the pewter shone as it had in its pennsylvania home and the conservative dutch women carried their customs and their atmosphere unspoiled into their new environment from the beginning these three of the harmless people as the dunkers used to be called bustled around in good old housewifely fashion and treated the tea-room in the same pleasant homely manner they always had their own well-scrubbed kitchen new york is hungry for home life and when these plain motherly souls came into the dining-room all genuine solicitude for their guests as if by their own hearthside and without pecuniary considerations they created an atmosphere very grateful to the homeless new yorkers end of chapter fifteen recording by holly jensen Chapter Sixteen of Betty Baird's Golden Year by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Sixteen. Betty organizes a city history club. Betty took her vacation in August, and every day Edwina claimed her as her own particular property. Dottie, her nearest neighbor, never failed to pay her a daily visit, and Edwina's set the girls who welcomed lois at the may-day party were usually in the group that surrounded betty while she her mother miss jane and lois read and sewed on the broad veranda or under the firs 
most of these girls were several years older than edwina though dotty of course was the pet and baby of the set Today they dragged betty off to one end of the veranda with the demand for a long long story thrusting her by main force into one of the huge porch chairs they ranged themselves around her quaint charming christine stopford dropped on the floor wholly indifferent to the fate of the dainty pongee coat that had just come from paris for christine's laughing blue eyes saw only virgil when betty was near and her fertile fancy was busy with delightful anticipations of an enchanting story thoughtful phyllis gray sank gracefully into a steamer chair her skirts falling naturally into symmetrical folds while priscilla whitford enthusiastic and endowed with initiative sat at the top step switching back her long brown hair as a preliminary to listening without any bother dotty arranged her stiffly starched skirts decorously looking prim and chubby as she outdid her elders in dignity and propriety in her duteous though alas short-lived recollection of her mother's parting admonition not to get must virginia low after spinning around on her toes like a gay little top sat with unaccustomed immobility near betty while pretty cheerful mary bell stratton sweet mary breslin and dainty nettie hood the little bookworm drew a settle up to the group edwina balanced on the edge of a brilliant red hammock and holding on firmly with both hands kept herself swinging by an industrious digging of her shining shoe tips into the floor her black hair was parted in the middle and held back by a roman striped ribbon edwina was still passionately fond of hair ribbons and they managed somehow always to be the perkiest little ribbons in the set though christine's top knot as betty called the broad bow on the top of the golden head was also in betty's language the most lovable their differing characteristics were of unfailing interest to betty and their pretty cajoling was bewitching to her as she looked at them with sweet laughing eyes while they huddled close around her in their eagerness and importunity this was by no means their first meeting with her during the winter the set had encircled the fire in the old-fashioned hall and betty on the long sofa with a child snuggled up close on each side of her it was the post of honor at which they took turns told about her boarding-school days at the pines when a really righty story was demanded to vary the legends of which betty had an unfailing store the history of the order of the cup which betty had founded among her friends at weston was of unceasing interest i don't see why we can't have a club of some kind cried priscilla to-day springing up in her eagerness and throwing herself on her knees before betty oh betty let's have a club let's came a chorus even dotty lisping out enthusiasm as rapidly as nature would allow let's let's christine and phyllis with their arms around each other crowded nearer for all were now on their feet edwina jumped out of the hammock and ran to betty hugging her about the neck priscilla had both her hands while dotty in a mad burst of the contagious enthusiasm tumbled headlong into her lap oh children children you're smothering me cried betty oh please excuse us said the older girls in a breath stepping back hastily you darling polite children cried betty who saw in a flash that their courteous little hearts had reproached them for appearing to be rude to her she gathered them into her arms stretching out her hands to catch the very last one of them now i wonder who's the old woman who lived in a shoe she had so many children she didn't know what to do she chanted and panted and all laughing joined in phyllis stepped back and fell into a brown study then she turned and whispered something to christine who clapped her hands delightedly and pushed her towards betty i've just thought of a plan for a club and christine likes it began phyllis excuse me but it's perfectly splendid interrupted christine her eyes glowing like stars she pressed closer and hugged phyllis's arm good phyllis let us hear what it is and turning to edwina and dotty who were engaged in a warm day wrangle she added you two children sit there on that settle and say prunes and prisms while we talk over phyllis's idea 
little dotty with literal obedience climbed up on the settle and began to pout out from her cherubic mouth prunes and prisms causing unbounded hilarity among the older girls but edwina's black eyes flashed and two red spots came to her olive cheeks as she walked with dignity to the hammock betty took in the situation at a glance and her eyes twinkled she motioned the other girls to sit down near her you've been telling us about the old presbyterian church and other historical buildings here said phyllis and i remember that my cousin margaret weldon who lives in new york belongs to the city history club connected with her father's parish she just loves it and they go around to see places last week they went in an automobile to see that church where the prince of wales's three feathers are phyllis paused looking inquiringly at betty that's st paul's the only surviving church of colonial times in new york city the prince of wales's feathers are at the top of the old pulpit why couldn't we have a city history club demanded priscilla a round of applause met this suggestion and edwina and dotty ran to join the group i think that would be very interesting said christine in a deliberative way i have always liked those little accounts of real things in the back of st nicholas and now we can have our own history well since the idea meets the approval of this august assembly we may as well organize and have a history club of course i can't give much time to it but lois will help and you children can soon carry it on for yourselves with a leader my cousin margaret is coming to spend part of the summer with us and she's fifteen and has been to boarding school so she must know a great deal and could help us suggested phyllis she would make an excellent leader and if she's been at boarding school why she must be wise laughed betty standing up and throwing her arms around phyllis and christine she led the way into the book room where they found paper and pens ready to hand in organizing the new club for betty never allowed the grass to grow under her feet when anything like this came up even the children felt the charm of the little book room it was directly back of the long drawing-room and wholly fulfilled the saying attributed to thomas a kempis i have sought rest everywhere and found it nowhere save in a little corner with a little book two deep windows overlooked the flower garden and a door at the side opening out onto the side porch stood open the room was flooded with sunshine and gay arabesques of vines and shrubs danced on the polished floor here's the very spot for the organization of the history club said betty a veranda is too frivolous it would do for a well say a dancing club shall we have a president began edwina eagerly and perhaps a trifle anxiously oh my yes let's have it grand and in full regalia i move that phyllis be made president because the plan is hers and she would make a splendid president anyway said generous christine the previous winter she had belonged to a little society in her school and the unconscious ease with which she made this motion excited her friend's admiration i didn't know we had such a parliamentarian among us said betty smiling down on the sweet upturned face christine blushed but looked gratified too for it is seldom that our hard-earned school accomplishments fit in so pat i second christine's motion said nettie rising and bowing primly to betty for she too belonged to a society priscilla is a lovely writer urged christine when the subject of a secretary for the club came up priscilla was elected forthwith at this betty noticed that edwina's face had grown very red and there was a suspicious winking of her black eyes she understood edwina was ambitious she had a child's desire to be at the head of everything this was the source of her frequent quarrels with the younger but not less ambitious dotty it had amused betty until she considered that love of power the desire to be the leader was growing to be the ruling idea with edwina in all plays and games betty suspected that she as the cousin of the club's leader had expected to be chosen for some office and that there was strange as it might seem genuine heart-burning in that little circle 
she looked curiously at christine to see whether she felt her lack of a post of honor and was delighted to find her forehead unclouded and that virginia mary bell mary and nettie were equally well contented excusing herself to the girls betty went out on the porch to consult her mother what shall i do carissima she asked sitting down by her mother's side and giving her a quick review of the past hour i feel cross with edwina for she is the only one who has shown an ugly spirit to-day poor little edwina said mrs baird smiling and stroking one of betty's hands tenderly she'll outgrow this trait if we are careful well it's perfectly horrid now burst out betty mortified at her cousin's behavior my daughter you can broaden her nature by showing her models of patriotism and disinterestedness and present to her and to all the girls a standard of right feeling towards others american history is crowded with glorious examples of unselfishness oh that's a splendid idea cried betty springing to her feet and walking up and down impetuously i see my way i'll try to help them get away from their own little selves yet that's not easy she added humbled by the thought of herself as a leader her own imperfections were well known to her hastening back to the book-room betty found that edwina had left the group and was haughtily sitting in an immense wing cosy chair engaged in writing a letter an arduous task for most children with edwina however the art was natural and at this moment of her slight as she conceived it to be she had hurried to show those girls that she too had her gifts her chin was up in the air and her whole manner invited inspection of her letter the girls pressed around her and exclaimed with genuinely big sisterly pride at her accomplishment oh betty edwina has written the cutest letter cried virginia mary took the letter from edwina's unresisting hand and showed it with much glee to betty as it so often happens edwina's naughty pretensions were immediately recognized and flattered and won the girls to beg for her the proud position of corresponding secretary betty shook her head disapprovingly that position is not needed in the club now but edwina may hold it she spoke sternly and the girls opened their eyes now let us go out on the porch for i'm going to preach she went on happily the threatened ordeal did not appear at all disagreeable to the girls if twinkling eyes and dimpling cheeks meant anything quite fearlessly they filed out after betty it's good for children to be preached to as april showers bring may flowers so well done duties bring heart beauties how's that for a rhyme the girls all laughed looking at each other delightedly for it was always such delicious fun to be near betty she leaned against the white fluted pillar and raising an interrogatory hand asked breathes there a man with soul so dead who never to himself hath said this is my own my native land betty broke off to wave the girls who were standing in a semicircle around her to seats sit down girls on these cushions those in blue and white are the pines pillows and are the seats of honor this vermilion one is for naughty little girls she added smiling on edwina and dotty with a wicked flash of her huckleberry black eyes edwina plumped down on it and pulled dotty struggling indignantly and insisting that she was a good girl down beside her it's a great privilege young ladies began betty to be american citizens i believe every one of us has a revolutionary ancestry and i do think it's about time that we know something definite of these forefathers of ours this city history club will meet regularly and i hope that through it we shall learn to appreciate better what they did for us though more than two hundred years have passed we should still be grateful to the early settlers of our country hear hear cried a manly voice and craig ellsworth his oars balanced in his right hand appeared around the corner of the porch to take his little sister home in his boat oh you craig come up sit down we're something very important now guess oh bother 
you know betty i never could guess anything retorted craig with an air of boredom while he threw himself down comfortably on the top step and eyed the girls with an amused smile sure enough poor fellow you can't guess anything can you betty returned pityingly then with an imposing manner she announced we are the city history club the city history club gee what's that he exclaimed looking around the circle again please exercise your imagination a little she replied crushingly my plan is this continued betty turning to the children we can beg borrow or hire an automobile or a hay wagon or something and visit the places around long island then go to new york for that city was one of the storm centers of the revolution mr brooks will take us in his big red automobile cousin betty broke in edwina surprised into the rudeness of an interruption by her interest he told me last evening that he'd do anything for me at this the older girls looked disconcerted they did not know how betty would take this liberty with the name of one they looked upon as her special friend that's an idea he'll be our knight to take us on our pilgrimages that it's a red touring car instead of a snowy white palfrey or a coal-black steed makes no difference except in poetry and speed won't you let me go too please pleaded craig i'll be court jester falconer or any old thing oh you may go as our our history is your specialty isn't it you can prepare the itinerary for our trip and call out the points of interest through a big megaphone ah you're too good mr and mrs king would take us and mr minturn too said edwina her black head nodding positively oh everybody will cried betty enthusiastically betty's love for the early days was genuine not inspired merely by pride of family and possessions but by a realization rare in a young girl of the splendor of the colonial dream and its magnificent and providential realization in the war for independence and she could feel keenly the hardships of those brave pioneers north and south and west during their wars with hostile indians the children had begun to chatter busily among themselves allowing betty freedom to think it over and to tell craig about the club and to ask his help which he gladly promised when miss bird comes in we'll ask her about her home in maryland and perhaps she'll invite us to visit her it's a quaint colonial village oh splendid cried priscilla while christine clapped her pink palms together delightedly and gave herself that little shuddering hug expressive of complete delight i love to see maryland especially baltimore said phyllis for my mother was born there and i've always wanted to see it washington isn't very far from baltimore is it betty asked virginia snuggling close to betty and looking up into her face not very answered betty patting the brown freckled cheek and i'd love to visit virginia said priscilla for my grandmother came from there betty and craig joined in a hearty laugh as soon as betty could get breath she said you dear things you'll drag me all around this blessed country if you don't stop soon now let's get down to business stop laughing craig or we'll not let you take us all over new york flourishing a big megaphone betty then instructed the girls to hunt up some historical fact about hobart or any place within easy driving distance and they would talk it over the next saturday afternoon even if two hit on the same subject she said it would be interesting to see it from two different points of view she asked them to talk over village traditions with old people and write them out and to give a description of any antique piece of furniture or china or brass or silver they possessed it would all help to construct a picture of those splendid early days betty paused for breath there that's a speech for you thank you betty said phyllis rising i do think you are so kind to take up your time for us in this way oh i love it otherwise i might not be so kind laughed betty now lois and i are going out for a drive behind the fattest laziest dearest pony on long island craig i know you have to take dotty home come over this evening and tell us all about columbia that night 
after her bedtime story edwina murmured her little prayer beside betty then jumped up rather hastily to hear her sandman story but betty gently drew her down again and knelt by her side may we be glad when others are glad and sorry when they are sorry may we be glad when others succeed and sorry when they fail after this significant prayer betty kissed her good night and was about to close the door when she heard edwina calling to her in a little voice betty ran over to her and edwina threw one arm around her neck and drew her ear down close to her mouth and whispered amen betty was never certain whether edwina had given way to unaccustomed contrition or had followed an impish impulse but she was wise enough not to propound the riddle to edwina End of chapter 16 Recording by Holly Jensen Chapter 17 of Betty Baird's Golden Year by Anna Hamlin Weichel This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen Chapter 17 Miss Snell Miss Minturn and Mr. Anstice were married very quietly on a brilliant day in early October and at once started on a year's journey round the world betty and lois went down to the pier to see them off and threw many kisses to the handsome happy bride and waved farewells with dainty handkerchiefs which they had to apply industriously to overflowing eyes as soon as their backs were turned they were two very disconsolate girls when they took the train for hobart betty thinking of the long year before she should see her friend again lois concerned more than she would admit about betty's future and her chosen work for miss minturn had sold her business to a miss snell giving betty however a one-fourth interest as a token of her love for two years the dream the romance of betty's young life had been to help her father free their home from its mortgage so they could look the dear old house in the face and say you are ours no one shares you with us of course this daydream was not all absorbing for betty's life like that of all young happy things had many mingling threads of interest in spite of this debt betty's home was always cheerful mrs baird never discussed at meals or other family gatherings the financial problems that occupied her mind when the inevitable interest was about to fall due she and betty would have a quiet little talk over ways and means usually though day after day passed in unbroken sunshine for the girls and youth and health in themselves antidotes to foreboding kept the big old-fashioned rooms filled with laughter music dancing and merry rompings there are few boys and girls who like the youthful warren hastings make a vow to redeem the stately possessions of their ancestors and cling through life for good or ill to the child's daydream boxwood was the only real home betty had ever known and perhaps her devotion to it surpassed that of those who have had the shelter of a house that has always been in the family her only other home had been the manse in weston and there many an official or officious member cautioned the little betty to be careful because it wasn't her own house but was church property even mrs baird in excessive conscientiousness would occasionally remind betty to be careful of the paint or paper because they belonged to the church for betty then a place of their own was an introduction not only to a genuine home but to liberty when miss minturn gave her the interest in the business betty saw that if the studio of design was carried on as it had been she could with her salary and her share of the profits add enough to her father's savings in two or three years to cancel the mortgage naturally she was full of glee over her partnership it was quite wonderful to be able to say our studio with the feeling of one-fourth proprietorship though this feeling it is true was not wholly new for betty had so identified herself with miss minturn's interests that our studio had always slipped easily from her tongue 
especially as miss minturne herself never used the excluding my for a few days then betty walked on rose-colored clouds but only for a few days soon there came a storm cloud that threatened their rosy hue of course lois and betty had wondered what manner of person miss snell would be though to be sure at their age a new personality in the business did not seem at all portentous and moreover at first sight there was nothing in miss snell's appearance to arouse apprehension even if she was exactly miss minturne's opposite she was short and stout and entirely lacked that grace that made miss minturne distinctive she was younger than miss minturne her suave manner combined with her large full gray eyes that seemed to embrace the whole world in charity gave an impression of benevolence on the surface her nature was kind it went out in all sorts of spontaneous acts yet she soon wearied of any one who interfered however slightly or unintentionally with her liberty or with her self-love the key to her attitude when she took charge of the studio was jealousy of her predecessor's influence with her associates and clients accordingly she began at once to change everything in order to undervalue miss minturne and to show that now she was the boss jealousy indeed so worked on her undisciplined nature that very soon she began to dismiss the old helpers one by one betty was tactful and just but she found that miss snell was high-handed and was determined to run things as she pleased without regard to her junior partner or reference to past policies or successes of the studio this place needs a perfect revolution snapped miss snell as she bounced into the room where betty was finishing a watercolor sketch for the decoration of a house for which plans had been drawn before miss minturne sold the studio at these words now used for the fortieth time it seemed to betty she felt two spots flame resentfully in her cheeks however she looked up inquiringly and miss snell had lost her temper to such an extent that betty's slight withdrawal at the word revolution passed unnoticed miss snell did not continue she bustled up to the desk and leaned over betty's chair glanced at her drawing then snatched it up soiling it as she rumpled it heedlessly between her fingers betty watched with indignant eyes but she restrained her temper and as she looked at the weak incompetent woman once more the whole situation flashed through her mind miss snell plumed herself on the fact that she had never studied artistic decoration she had picked it up it came naturally she said before many days had passed it was not necessary for her to insist on her first statement it was only too easily believed by those who had been with miss minturne that it came naturally remained to be proved she is untrained betty thought and doesn't know how to carry on this work and it irritates her but she won't acknowledge it to herself or of course to anyone else that makes her ugly about miss minturne and everyone here miss snell was holding the drawing at arm's length and examining it through half-closed eyes this will never do never in the world i see i'll have to ask miss rudder to go over your work in fact you needn't trouble yourself further about it i'll have miss rudder draw up some plans that i'm sure will please mrs lelesh much better throwing it down on the desk with a hopeless air miss snell prepared to move off excuse me miss snell began betty in a tense voice her eyes blazing what do you see to criticize in this i shall be glad to have definite criticism miss snell had never been pinned down to specific criticism and could not make it definite directions were impossible to her she tore down in a vague way but never built up there's no need of losing your temper she said with that assumption of superiority that is so irritating i see miss minturne in every line of this drawing i don't agree at all with her ideas in decoration and in time i shall make radical changes here this place needs a revolution 
i can't have my studio carried on in this way betty drew herself up and her face grew pale with indignation please remember miss snell she said quietly that this is our studio not yours alone however i think it is a very good idea as mrs lelesh is such an important client for you to have miss rudder draw up another plan then we can submit both of them for her choice knowing miss rudder's ability as i do i am confident that mrs lelesh will not care to see any other plans than hers miss snell replied leaving hastily betty sat down dazed looking at the drawing over which she had spent so many hours of hard work she felt that this was the best thing she had ever accomplished she will run this business into the ground she groaned then where will be the money for the mortgage poor old daddy despair crept into her heart none the less bitter because it was a girlish heart that had tucked away in it many happy adjusting resources she decided not to say anything to her parents about this for the present for they had been delighted over her unexpected good fortune and perhaps something might turn up to bring things to right she picked up the rejected plans and looked at them long and critically then with a smile she began to clean off the finger marks made by miss snell as she worked her smile grew brighter we'll wait until mrs lelesh comes she liked our rough sketch and as she is the one who is paying for it i rather think she'll have something to say about it end of chapter seventeen recording by holly jensen